Welcome to the Regent Brands Podcast. This is a place for consumers, operators, and investors to learn about the consumer brands supporting regenerative agriculture and how they're changing the world. This is your host, Kyle, joined by my co-host, AC, who's going to take us into the episode. On this episode, we have Paul Lightfoot, who is the general manager of Patagonia Provisions. Patagonia Provisions is the food arm of Patagonia, where they are building regenerative supply chains and products with the goal of saving our home planet. In this episode, we learn about the origins of provisions and their plans for the next evolution of the business. Plus, we talk to Paul about provisions' role as a supply chain architect that can help scale regeneratively produced products to commercial success. Paul is a true champion of regenerative agriculture, and it was so cool to get an update from him as he is closing in on one year in this new role. This is a good one, folks. Let's dive in. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Regen Brands Podcast. We slash I are fired up today to have Paul Lightfoot from Patagonia Provisions. My co-host, Kyle, is stranded at the San Francisco airport, so I'm flying solo today, but uh, no dampening the excitement to have Paul joining us. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely, man. Um, really excited for this conversation. I think it's going to be great. For those that that don't know what Patagonia Provisions is, just give us a brief high level description on what, what the company does and um, you know all that jazz. Yeah, Patagonia Provisions is the food and beverage division of, of Patagonia, the company best known for its outdoor gear and apparel. And you know the mission of Patagonia is a simple one. It's to save our home planet. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and Patagonia Provisions, we believe, I believe, I think everybody here believes is, is perhaps the most important lever Patagonia can pull to fulfill its mission with the understanding that right now our food system sort of makes things worse. It's, it's bad for health. It's bad for the planet, but mm. food can be grown in a way that's actually quite good for all of those things. And our job is to create market opportunities to transform the food system for the better. Mm. Wow. Beautiful, b- beautiful stuff. And I can, I can see why that, that large kind of audacious goal has gotten you involved. Uh, and we'll definitely get into that. Um, before we do, you know, talk talk the audience through. Y- you mentioned the mission of Patagonia Provisions, but why did Patagonia get into the food business? Like, what's the what's the origin of this thing? How long has it been around? What's the background story there? Yeah, like a lot of the big initiatives at Patagonia, I think it was conceived originally by Yvonne Chouinard, right? Who mm-hmm. understood before most people that regenerative agriculture is is the key to you know creating harmony between humans and the earth really i guess humans and the ability to keep having humans in the future the earth would mm. be fine without us just like it mm. was fine without the dinosaurs right and so it's not just food right it's food and fiber because we make apparel as well but mm. but you know i believe that yvonne had this um this vision more than 10 years ago and with the, the former ceo um, really set up a, a division that initially spent a few years creating really innovative supply chains, right? Like like building mm. products um, from farms, from ingredients that hadn't really been done before with a really clear idea of solving problems to help fight the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, it's been probably in the market for six or seven years and has mm. had some some really cool, fun successes. And my mandate now is to is to really make it commercially scalable. Mm. Yeah. Which that that's so exciting, and I love I love that you're you know stepping into the role uh, that you haven't been in for for too too long. With the key phrase that I heard and what you just said was really bringing innovative supply chains. Because if we're going to scale regenerative uh, and really commercially scale, like you said, we're building supply chains. We're not just building brands, and that's such a common theme really that we've had on every episode. Which is it's not just nailing the brand and the CBG side of this thing; it's nailing the entire supply chain and. Um, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting about y'all is we have a lot of people on this podcast that they kind of maybe just have one hero product or maybe they have a suite of products, but there's way more complexity to what y'all do with all the different categories of, of food and beverage that you touch. Um, so we'd love to hear you kind of speak to that and maybe what is that, is that going to kind of stay the same? What are some challenges that bring? Just talk to me about that kind of the breadth of the portfolio right now and how that affects like strategy and, and execution. Complexity isn't isn't our friend, right? So in mm. general, I think the business was a bit too complex when I got to it, and, and one of mm. my jobs has been to making making it simpler. And I'll just mm. give you an example. You know, this is uh, this is a pasta that we make and we sell 
that's mm. made with the hero ingredient called Kernza, right? Which is a perennial yep. grain that builds soil, makes for more resilient farmland, um, you know, sequesters carbon from the atmosphere. It, it was one item in, you know, Whole Foods in North Carolina, in um, Northern California. And what we all know, you're a, a student of the CPG industry, is that mm -hmm. one item can't succeed in, in a store, mm -hmm. right? A, a shopper will walk by and never notice it. Um, mm -hmm. And having one item with its own co-packer, its own supply chain, its own sources of regenerative wheat and Kernza is really expensive because of that complexity. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we actually love the product. We love the supply chain. We love the taste and the quality. So we've built a family around it. We now have a plan to launch um, five other pasta items. So we have a family and, um, mm. and and that family will be rolled out nationally where it could be a brand block where a, a shopper would walk down an aisle and say, boom, there's a, a, a Patagon, Patagon's pasta company. Who knew? And here's a pasta with an interesting story that's both delicious and, and reasonably priced. So that's the kind of thing that we're doing to get rid of complexity. It also means that some of the products that we had we decided, you know, we didn't want to keep going with because mm. they we're adding complexity without adding um, that much chance to scale commercially and, and make an impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that it's beautifully said. And that's another kind of tension point is like, how do we make holistic regenerative decisions, right? And, and work in full context and uh, handle that complexity the, the appropriate way, but in a way that can work, right? Because if it doesn't work, then it, it doesn't work. Um, and I think that's that's something we hear a lot of folks talk about is the is the pasta line all going to be Kernza based or different wheats or I don't know if you can share that yet, but curious there. Uh, I'll share it with you, Anthony. It's, it's not it hasn't been shared anywhere else yet. Uh, the, pasta, <laughs> the pasta will be all regenerative organic certified um, and it will be both uh, semolina wheat and Kernza in some of the products mm. and just semolina wheat in other products um, so that we've got a variety for and, and in different shapes for consumers to choose from. Yeah. And but I'll go back to your the premise of that more specific question, right? Which is like how mm -hmm. do you how do you choose? That was one of the first challenges I decided to tackle when I got here. Um, mm. the business had been, you know, a little bit in an experimental phase. <clears throat> before I arrived, which I think was appropriate and great and, and, and really served the business well. It's the foundation upon which I'm building. Um, yeah. But we needed to have a rubric for making really solid choices quickly about mm. what we should be in, what we shouldn't be in, and, and, and what mm. we should be in in the future. And so we created a, a rubric, right? And, and you know, rubric is a fancy word maybe for a Venn diagram that you use to make choices. Right? But imagine the Venn diagram has, <laughs> yeah. has four circles. The top yeah. left circle is quality, which is how does mm. it taste? What's the nutrition like? What's the safety? A few other things. Mm -hmm. The top right would be environmental impact, which includes obviously mm. uh, carbon footprints or LCA stuff, but also biodiversity and, and other environmental um, uh, attributes. Yep. The bottom left would be demand in the marketplace. How, mm. Do people want this? How do we know they want it? Do we see repeat purchasing, things like that? And then the bottom right is unit economics, right? Are the gross margins of this mm. product sufficient enough that it will be able to scale? Because you know, as you know, you can't make up for uh, you can't make up in volume what you, what you lack in, in profits per per, uh, per unit, right? And by mm. having that that we spent the first few months together, sort of building that rubric, and now yeah. it's a decentralized process. People on my team take this rubric and apply it to ideas, and it makes us more effective and more efficient at making good choices. So that was really probably the first. You know, three or four months that I got here was making sure we had a good tool for choosing what to be in. I love that, and I, I think that could be a tool for the entire space, right? Because it takes that complexity, complexity, and it gives you a tool to make it simple and to to increase the efficiency and the speed of those decisions, like you mentioned. Um, and you know, you and I both come from a background in the fresh produce space where simplicity is king. Simplicity and speed is king because everything spoils and everything goes bad. <laughs> so you have no choice but to be efficient and quick and mm -hmm. swift. Um, but I think that's a really good dovetail into, you know, share, share about your background and kind of how you came to provisions and why that was so compelling to you. And really, you know, you come from fresh produce and uh, indoor ag, and now, you know, you're, you're really stepping into a big role in regenerative agriculture. So how did all that come about? 
you know, looking backwards, it often makes sense, right? But if you yeah. went back in time and looked forward, it wouldn't make sense. I mean, I'll, yeah. I'll go back. I'm, I just turned, I just turned fifty three, but I'm, mm. but I'm super, I'm super immature, right? So I'm, I'm very young. <laughs> In my 30s, I was running a software company that, that improved mm. the operations of distribution centers of retailers. So I had this like retail supply chain depth mm. and understanding, but I, I didn't have the purpose I wanted in my career. And mm. as I got to the end of my 30s, I was looking for a midlife crisis, perhaps, although midlife, <laughs> midlife seemed like 40 back then. It doesn't mean midlife seems like 53 right now. And mm -hmm. I, I decided that local produce was going to have a mm. moment. And this was, you know, this was like 2009, 2010, you know, local yeah. was big in, in fine dining table service restaurants. It wasn't in retail yet. And I could right. see that some of what had happened in organic would happen again in, in local. And I mm -hmm. saw a chance to build out a business to disrupt a supply chain, which was the, the sort of Salinas oligarchy of packet salads, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that worked, by the way. That, that's the short version of the story. It didn't feel mm -hmm. like it was working the whole way, but it, <laughs> over an 11-year journey, was, was a series of near-death experiences, it, 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 turned out, yeah. it turned out to work. And I was, you know, along the way of that 11-year journey, I would say at six or seven years in, I really started getting my head involved with regenerative agriculture's role in fighting the climate crisis in the future. Mm -hmm. And I knew that the climate crisis, as I was approaching... 50 was so mm -hmm. much more important and loomed large in my mind than it was when I was approaching 40. And mm -hmm. so I decided I wanted to spend the rest of my career. This wasn't a one-time decision. It, it grew on me over, over the several years, yeah. the rest of my career, thinking about food's role in the climate crisis, which turned out to be with regenerative agriculture. Mm. <clears throat> the business that eventually acquired Bright Farms is a, a terrific company called Cox Enterprises. You know, they're very careful. And so they and we agreed on a very careful uh, exit strategy for me. I hired mm -hmm. my successor with my board. Eventually they bought the company. I stuck around for a period. But mm -hmm. that, that careful transition gave me time to start thinking outside of Bright Farms. Mm -hmm. And I even got some of my time back. And, I, and you might remember, I, I was writing a newsletter yeah. called the Native yeah. Foods Newsletter. And it was about the ascendancy of brands that would have regenerative agricultural supply chains. And, mm -hmm. you know, I did that because I wanted to become deep and, and smart in regenerative agriculture, particularly that had brands in the front of it so that it could capture mm -hmm. the rising consumer demand for food that was better for the planet. And, um, you know, the story, it's one of these funny stories, right? Like they didn't have any logic to it. But one day I just got a yeah. call from a, a head owner saying there's an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to build a food brand at, at Patagonia. And I, what they didn't know, and you don't know maybe, is that I was the number one most loyal Patagonia customer in the world. Like, <laughs> like I was nuts about Patagonia. I'm a big snow sports yeah. guy, I'm a big outdoors guy. Yeah. And I was really vulnerable to uh, to their pitch. Like when they called yeah. me, it was probably October, <laughs> so like a year and a half ago. I had just written a manifesto about where I wanted to spend the rest of my career. Yeah. Published it in my newsletter publicly. And like a month later, I got a call from a headhunter and Patagonia had created a document describing the business and the role. Mm. And it so closely matched my own manifesto for how I wanted to wow. spend the rest of my career that I just, you know, I, it was, I, I couldn't, I couldn't admit that I was, you know, smitten. I yeah. so much so <laughs> that after my first interview with the headhunter, not even an internal person yet, I wrote an yeah. essay and sent it to them saying, this is my vision for what I would do if I had this job. And wow. then every Every interview that I had, and I had a thousand, it went on for months, they're very mm. careful hiring, but every interview I had, I would end by saying, I'll take it. I'm ready to go. Mm. I'll move my whole family. I'll change my whole life. Not what wow. you thought in negotiation school, but, but I was like, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't care. I'm authentic and mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hide the ball. Uh, and eventually, you know, they, uh, eventually they, they made the offer and, and now I'm, yeah, I'm moved to California after living in New York since since I was 23 and uh, yeah. moving my family in batches, selling the house, you know, yeah, building a new life here and loving it. It's beautiful. Uh, I'm sure there's so much transition that came with that, but it's it shows the power of uh, the power of manifestation or putting it out there in the universe. Uh, I, think that's, I, I, I believe it, yeah. Yeah. Um, you've obviously spent a lot of time selling food to people or working in companies that sell food to people. And you're clearly very, very bullish on 
the fact that you think consumers are demanding and will continue to increasingly demand carbon negative foods or socially conscious foods or sustainable foods, whatever we want to call them. Um, you know, I, I go back and forth and we've had a lot of conversations on this show about how do we really get in touch with that consumer? Do we still have to lead with the traditional value drivers of taste, flavor, you know, scent, uh, appear, and then we have to bring in regen on the back end? Do we, do we lead with carbon, you know, um, carbon footprint, uh, stickers or labels, you know, like, so as you've kind of stepped into this more operating role and out of the, the more philosophy role that you were kind of doing to, to kind of get there, how, how has that changed and how are you approaching the business from a, how the hell do we get this consumer demand engine revving for regenerative agriculture? Well, it's important to remember that it's not the same for every segment of the market, right? So mm. different, different mm. factors drive consumers in different places and different times, right? In mm. produce, in fresh produce, it was often appearance that was the first Big time. to generate trial. Um, and then after that, it was, you know, the, the taste and, and eating experience, right? Um, mm -hmm. Patagonia has such a rich history of success when it comes to the way that consumers, or we, we actually generally use the word customers because we don't like to think about people consuming jackets yeah. and shirts. We want them to have one jacket yeah. for seven years and they get repaired, right? But yeah. it... And Yvonne Chouinard always says this, always says this, and it's one of these things that is very true. The quality has to be first, right? <clears throat> if you make a product with low quality but great environmental impact, it's not going to have much of an impact, right? And mm -hmm. even worse, <clears throat> it's going to diminish the the confidence that the, that the buyer has in you as a brand, right? And so we always keep that in mind. And if someone if someone in my office said, "Hey, tomorrow we're going to choose between," The highest quality and and the most environmental impact i would say i'm that's a false choice like i'm, I'm not going to make it mm. go back go back and and make the harder work completed so that mm. you can have both so the good news though and remember i define quality it, it's actually a complicated matrix but it starts with like the three pillars of like taste nutrition and, and food safety right it turns out that with and you know this but with regenerative you're not mm -hmm. making some compromise between taste and right. environmental impact or taste and nutrition. It turns out that regenerative agriculturally produced food is better for mm -hmm. taste, for nutrition and environmental, in, environmental impact, right? So we get to do all these things at once. The way that you tell the story to the consumers is, is really, really important, right? Mm -hmm. And I do think that, that you know, most consumers that are thinking about buying food in the segments of the market that we're in do care about the environmental impact. Some people, don't, by the way, and that that's just not mm -hmm. part of the market that we're leading with. Um, mm -hmm. But but the ones that we're talking to do, and I'm lucky to be in a company that has a really long history and the machine that knows how to tell stories. You know, we have mm -hmm. when I got here, this business, which is a, a pretty small business of a of a of a pretty big business, it yeah. had a storytelling machine. We have editors and photographers and graphic designers that tell mm -hmm. stories beautifully, and that's just part of part of the DNA of the business and part of how we intend to, to win in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's super important because uh, I think there's a lot of methodologies or, or, or folks kind of vying for that sustainable share of wallet with a, with a customer, right? You got Region Ag, you got food tech, you got uh, CEA, you have all these kind of different players and, and there's probably room at the table for everybody. But I do think the best storytellers are going to win. And I do think we have the most compelling story to tell when, when we do it right. Um, so I love that y'all are putting some, some assets there. Um, how, how are you weaving that into the supply chain work and really the product development work? And as you're thinking through kind of bringing these things to market with that storytelling marketing piece, like how is that all coming together? Well, you know, storytelling, if it's not true, doesn't last very long. Mm. Right? So mm. we start by having like complete synchronicity among the different elements of the business, right? That rubric mm. I talked about earlier, you know, with, with quality, environmental impact, uh, demand and unit economics, that actually started on the product development side of things because we wanted to start mm. off by thinking mm -hmm. about what products should we be in, what products should we not be in, what products should we be in in the future. Um, but there's no disconnect between the product 
the product part of the business and the, the storytelling and the sales and, and, and marketing part of the business, right? So we just make sure that we're all on the same page. And, um, you know, I, it's, I almost said I'm, I'm lucky and I am lucky, right? But it's mm-hmm. not luck. We happen to be in a moment in history where consumers' awareness of the role of food in, in destroying the planet is pretty high. And mm-hmm. many consumers' desire to be part of the solution is also pretty high. Uh, just, I think it was two to, yeah, Tuesday, I was on a call with the buyer of one of our products categories at a major food retailer, you know, and she was really bullish on the regenerative organic certification regime. Mm. She was pumped up about it mm. and, you know, said yes to a pitch to carry more of our products and more of their stores, partly because she believed in that. And it wasn't, she wasn't speaking from a position of altruism, although mm-hmm. I think she did feel good to be doing the right thing. She understood so that a customer's care about this now right so Mm -hmm. and this is the lucky part but but of course it's not luck all of these things are happening at the same time retailers understand it consumers are wanting it and more farms are turning their attention toward meeting that market demand and that that's like that's the role of patagonia provisions right we're creating market demand that consumers Mm -hmm. are, are are giving us a chance to meet so that we can buy from farms to help convince more farmers to convert their practices to regenerative Mm. I'm, I, as you can tell, I'm like, I'm a yeah. realist, but I'm also optimistic at the same time. Yeah. It's really funny. You say that I th- that was, I was like on the phone with my mom the other day and I was like, you know, the, our success as a movement will be largely determined by be, the ability to have such an intense passion about the, the amount of change and impact that needs to be created, but also build something that can exist enough in the present moment with all the, with all the bad stuff going on and then kind of merge at this, at this precipice. Um, so I couldn't agree more with that. Um, is ROC a baseline, like, like a little, like a little asterisk somewhere on that Venn diagram page that is like, we're not going to release any new products that aren't ROC moving forward or, or no. So, you know, this is one of my seafood items right here. I'm holding up, right? Yeah. You can't have organic certification for seafood. It's not available, right? It's just not the way that, that seafood works. Um, so no, we don't have a blanket restriction that it has to be mm-hmm. ROC, but for products that can be ROC, our goal is to either have them be ROC or be on the path toward ROC. Yeah, yeah. we think that we think that the regenerative organic um, certification is a super important signal to consumers. And we think that, you know, well, not everyone agrees, but you know that I believe that consumer demand is going to be the lever that, that changes the food system, right? And mm-hmm. we... And you know, this has been said over and over again, but we run the risk of regenerative not having meaning if yeah. we let if we let big food or, or even worse, big ag sort of mm-hmm. use it in ways that aren't meaningful. And so having a high standards label on the product is a signal that mm-hmm. I think consumers are going to want. And you can see the rise of ROC, like the number of farms, number of products is skyrocketing right now, which I think demonstrates that it is mm-hmm. getting traction in the marketplace and the high standards that ROC brings is what Patagonia really craves and needs, right? We are the we are the business that wants to have the highest standards everywhere that, that we operate, even if it's sometimes at the cost of commercial success. That's fine. We, we pay that price. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's a long play, one. And two, I think something that we could all improve upon as a space is we forget that we have to translate things for customers, right? So what I mean by that is, me and you can have a very high level conversation around regenerative is a continuum and, and there's like all these kind of different things that, that there's practices versus like you are regenerative or certifications or whatever people's opinions are there. But at the end of the day, on the customer side, we have to put a product on the whole food shelf that has a moniker that in three seconds they can make a purchasing decision based on. And so that's, that's are, those are different things and different conversations. And sometimes we try to kind of talk about them in a monolith and they, they, they need to be separated or at least have that, that nuance involved in the conversation. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 Um, what's, I'm curious, you know, what's been a challenge or something that you didn't expect in the role that, that you've kind of had to deal with uh, at, at Provision so far? So when I, so, you know, when I got here, I was given a pretty clear mandate, right? You mm-hmm. Take a business that's done some great things and scale it in a way that's commercially successful. Not mm-hmm. by the way, for the sake of growth, Patagonia doesn't believe in chasing revenue growth for its own sake or for the economic reasons. 
but because we want to have impact and we can't have impact at a, at a, at a niche scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, some of the strategic directions that we should go in and some of the strategic directions that we should not go in weren't that hard to see. What was difficult was just getting things changed at the mm. rate that I that I mm -hmm. heard or thought was thought was recommended. The entrepreneur's dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> well, to go fast. And, and, you know, I'm in. I'm in. I'm part of a, a much larger company than my last company had been. Right. There's right. Well, when my last company is pretty big now, but when I started it, it was you know, it was me. Right. It was very easy to make right. decisions. It was just me. Um, so. And this is, you know, this is an organization that had ways of doing things and uh, and in some ways had s some slowness baked into it that I had to, you know, I had to get around. I had to I had to mm -hmm. find ways to break and, and push. That was mm -hmm. harder than I expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's not surprising. Um, I think that with any with any large organization, right, you're going to have you're going to have that. Um one thing we like to do that I don't know if you're able to do right now is we have people compare maybe one of their products or their supply chain to what the the majority of that supply chain looks like in this country. Like what what is your what does one of your products look like versus a conventional counterpart? So is there a current product or or an upcoming product where you could kind of give the audience something to tangibly associate with? Hey, this is what a regenerative supply chain looks like versus our conventional counterparts. Yeah. I'd love to, right? So let's, I'll give you two and you can choose which one you want to use. Yeah. Muscles is mm. a, a product line of ours. We sell muscles, it's in tins, right? It's like, it's a okay. canned product that has a long shelf life. And muscles are bivalves, right? And, and bivalves done right mm. will um, will actually make the water cleaner, right? Which is a, another way of saying regenerative for the ocean instead of, mm -hmm. instead of for the soil. Um, it hasn't, tin fish, has not had a lot of successful muscles in it in, in the United States. And we started sourcing from a place in Galicia, Spain a few years ago. And the muscles right now are just really killing it in the marketplace, uh, partly because it's a great product that's done a good mm -hmm. job, partly also because we've, we've, you know, we've had some luck. You know, we went a little bit viral in the fall on TikTok with our muscles, which was not mm -hmm. something I'd ever Love experienced that. before. I know, it, 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 even as I say it, I'm not sure I believe myself, but it's in the, it's in the data, right? Yeah. Success on TikTok begot success at Whole Foods, right? Which was like yeah. mind blowing, right? Wow! And um, that product is from a mm. population that's healthy and, and rising. It's not this, you know, the mussels. There's, there's no fisheries problem. It's um, it's harvested in a way that's low impact. It makes the water um, cleaner. So sort of everything about that supply chain story is a winner, and mm. uh, and it's successful. And I don't want to compare that to other mussels. You asked me to compare it. I want to compare it mm -hmm. to seafood, right? Seafood mm -hmm. in the United States, uh, although I should probably say seafood worldwide, is an mm -hmm. absolute catastrophe. We sometimes mm -hmm. like to think of the big enemies that we're out fighting against in the world. And the, the net pen salmon farming industry is one of those big enemies. It is, mm -hmm. the, 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 it is the feedlot cattle industry of the sea. The right. biggest difference is that people don't see it because it's underwater. But it destroys marine ecosystems. It destroys um, coastal societies. It's truly an evil, awful thing, as, as bad as tobacco and, and oil companies. Wow. And um, and so we're happy to be giving people a, um, a, a seafood program that they can feel good about that's good for the health and that's good for the ocean. Mm. Um, another example, mm -hmm. we just finished a set of tests brewing beer with three partners that are each yeah. given their geography. Um, yeah. Topa Topa in Southern California, Russian River in the Bay Area, and Hub, Hopper Urban Brewery in Portland. And uh, this summer, in late June, we're rolling out with a bunch of other brewers. And we're doing something super unusual. It's a licensing partnership, but we're finding values-aligned brewers and hmm. partnering in a specific geography. And under our, you know, our consent and approval rights, they're brewing beer under the Patagonia label and wow. they're distributing it and marketing in, in these markets. And mm. what's awesome about it is that we're finding, you know, great 1% for the planet and B Corp craft brewers. And we're basically creating a, a reasonably low alcohol, easy to drink beer that we think the Patagonia customers will love, you know, the, the surfers mm. and, and snowboarders and, and, and rock climbers. And yeah. um, the test results were sort of astoundingly exciting. And 
we're as part of the partnership, the brewers are required to use Kernza for at least fifteen mm. percent of the grain bill in the beer. Mm. And together, the brewers in Patagonia will find local environmental nonprofits that will give grants to in that region where the beer is being sold. And like this is this is going to be a beer product that is targeted to environmental outdoor enthusiasts. That I've never had so much confidence. It's it is we are shooting an arrow and it is hitting a bullseye and it's going to be mm. a blockbuster. Um, and it's just so much fun and it's so exciting. And there's lots of great craft beer out there, but really right now the craft beer industry is in a little bit of a funk because, you know, like ready to drink cocktails and white claws have taken over a lot of the young person's mm. market, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of growth for people who care about the impact of their food in beer. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to eat it up and pump up about it. Mm, yeah, that, I mean, both both amazing examples. The beer one, my like, I'm like getting chills about the beer one because, <laughs> what, I mean, the biggest thing that sticks out to me is one thing where I feel like I'm a little contrarian in the space is we don't need to rebuild all the infrastructure in the food space, especially in the middle supply chain. We just need to redirect it to better to better use. And so, you know, yeah. some people might say, "Hey, we want to start a regenerative beer company. Let's go build a bunch of breweries." It's like not so fast, my friend. Like let's Let's use the existing infrastructure where we know that our values aligned consumer are already frequent, right? Just like you're doing here. And let's just partner with them, right? And like redirect some of that existing infrastructure to better use. Um, and I think that's enough. Like we're, we're not going to scale this thing fast enough without massively redirecting a bunch of current infrastructure because we just can't build brand new, an, enough brand new infrastructure from the ground up to do it at the speed we need to do it. So I love that. Well, and, and imagine if you decided to build a whole new brewery industry all the wasted resources on the mm. old breweries mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. <laughs> you could say the same thing about distribution and restaurants and, and even co-packers right I, mm -hmm. I i remember writing about this in my newsletter you're absolutely right we mm -hmm. have to use the existing engineers and salespeople and infrastructure or else we're going to just waste so much mm -hmm. expertise so many resources yeah we got to mm -hmm. we got to yeah, we got to fit a pig through the same python, but have it be done mm. in a way that has a better impact. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, I come from one of those food institutions that the average consumer would never know about, but has a large effect on where many geographies eat and how they eat. Um, and there's so much tribal knowledge and supply chain, supply chain intimacy that if we totally recreated them, we would just lose so much value. Right. And those people are willing to play ball, but they largely just do what the two ends of the supply chain tell them to do. And so we just need to give them better instructions and incentives and they will do what we need them to do. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit about high level. What does the future look like for Patagonia Provisions? What else can you share there? Uh, what else can you share? Like what, what does Patagonia Provisions look like in five, you know, seven, 10 years? Um, bunch of new products you know like what what comes to mind with that question we're gonna be always in product families in the future right and i described mm -hmm. earlier how we, we in our more experimental early stages we weren't always so you know a year from now you'll see us patagonia pasta company patagonia is mm. a beer company patagonia is mm. a seafood company it's another category we're going to announce next week at Expo. So if you ask me again in a week, I would describe that category as well. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, we're probably, I would say, going to add a category a year. And not certain, but I would say that right now, the, mm. the subsequent two categories probably include trail foods, um, partly because mm. we think there's some interesting things to be done there, partly because we know that Patagonia customers and loyalists are, are on the trails, right? And right. then beyond that, we actually, and this is going to sound a little bit boring, but I don't, I don't mind being boring. Uh, impact, <laughs> is, in, impact is exciting, right? And, and, and uh, converting farmland is exciting. We're going to probably be in pantry staples. Like I'd like to see mm. us in two or three years having regenerative organic certified rice and pulses and legumes mm -hmm. and bringing people products that, you know, they use in their homes every day that don't have a lot of packaging because we think that growing that sort of stable um, pantry items that people use a lot is an important mm -hmm. part of the of, of the impact story of people's diets, right? We we don't want to just be having 
occasion food. We don't want to just be having cute food, right? We want to be having the foods that people use to sustain their families. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And I love the the trail foods and, and other kind of concepts that are already with that Patagonia hero consumer, right? Especially because it allows you to tap into so much existing distribution from a brick and mortar retail standpoint, because, you know, REI is selling how many SKUs of food items now, which is like, it's crazy. Just the evolution of where food is sold. And I, I, I love the the kind of efficiencies or opportunities you can tap into with that one for sure. Yeah. REI is a great customer and, and a good friend of ours. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's go a little macro, right? So let's back out of Patagonia provisions. You're obviously an amazing champion of the space, even before you're in this role and now even more so, but let's kind of riff on how do we, how do we do this at, at a really big scale? Right. What, what is that? What is that really going to take? Um, and I'm kind of jumping around, but I want to go to the last question first, which is not going to be our last question today, but it's really just to put a quantifiable on that. You know, how do we, how do regen brands get to 50% market share by 2050? What, what do we really need to do to accomplish that? And I know it's gonna be a big answer. So feel, feel free to let it sit for a second before you tackle it. You know, it's not like, it's not, no, I don't need to wait. Like, it's not like <laughs> you've thought about it. Like, this is not how it's always been, right? Like mm. the way that we're growing food now is it's an ephemeral thing. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's fucked, right? The idea that <laughs> most of the food in the United States is grown with, I mean, most, honestly, it's, it's almost entirely, you know, coming from the great plains with chemical farming, right? Haber Bosch, mm -hmm. Um, derived uh, synthetic fertilizers, um, fossil fuel based um, uh, herbicides and pesticides. And um, that's new. Like that wasn't like that in the 1950s mm -hmm. and 60s, right? And if you think about the arc of humanity, that's like, that's like, that just happened. And we had this moment where it seemed a little bit magical. Oh, look, we can, we can use fossil fuels, we can create lots of yields, mm -hmm. and it's great. But, you know, the farmers got into these loops, right, where they needed more and more inputs at higher and higher cost. And it, it, it hasn't been worth it because the value of their land and the, and the amount of their topsoil has degraded, right? Um, mm. That's becoming more and more clear and obvious. And lots of farmers that are still stuck in those loops where their suppliers, they even the ones that are still in it, recognize that it's, it isn't mm. a super wholesome long-term place to be, right? And... I, I'm not one of these people that argues that you can get higher yields with regenerative practices, but I am one of these people that argues you, you can get better profits because you've got mm. so, so many less input costs, right? So yeah. I, I do think that, that the, the capacity of farmland is there. And, you know, whenever, you know, Anthony, I, I did some angel investing in, in my interstitial mm -hmm. period of my career before I got here, right? I used to get pitch decks that would have like, the first page would be like, we don't have enough food in the world to feed everyone in 20 years. Right? And I, every time I saw that, I thought that's a business that doesn't know what its business model is. Right. Because 40% yeah. of food produced in America is, is wasted. Is right. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the great plains, which was our most productive soil is used for growing ethanol, which is not mm. necessary. It, it, it's mm. energy wise and, and that negative or for growing grains for feedlots. Right. Which is a mm -hmm. bad, that conversion ratio doesn't make sense. If you grew food for humans, you'd have so much more food. So there's mm. plenty of capacity. There's plenty of opportunities for farmers to make enough money growing food mm. in these areas. What the farmers need is to understand that they have a, a market for growing mm. food that way. And that's that's my job, right, is to create the market demand. And so I, I think like mm -hmm. in these early days, we have to sometimes go out and directly contract with the farmers, which is mm. not not how it is in a mature industry. I, I should be able to go to my co-packer yeah. and say, this is my spec sheet. This is the product. Make it for me. Yeah. Today, I have to go to them. And then together, we go to the mill. And together, we go to the farms. And we work on these sort of complicated four-way four -way or three-way deals. Um, mm -hmm. But it's still the same. We have to create the market opportunity. And that's not some like sacrifice. I'm not doing this because mm -hmm. it's altruistic, although I think it is good for the world. The demand is there right now, right? It's just hard to get organizations to change. This is the benefit I have from having a small organization. I'm not Nestle, which has to worry about cannibalizing its billions of dollars of products out there that aren't that aren't doing good for the world. I don't mm -hmm. have to worry about any of that. I can go out and disrupt everybody else and, and start mm -hmm. from scratch. And that's that's exactly what we're doing. 
Yeah. So back to that whole supply chain architecture, right? And it's like, that's how we scale this thing is we, we, we architect these things from the ground up and that kind of clean slate or, um, you know, where you're at is, is beautiful because it, it provides a lot of optionality. Um, but it is so different from the incumbent process right now of take the spec sheet, take the ingredient list. You know, they have that on the shelf. They make the product, they package the product, they, they do all that. Um, but we got to get there, right? We got to get there. Yeah. You know, the, the person who said that concept best is Alice Waters, right? And, and, and mm. I, I've heard her say like, restaurants need to get away from this mentality that they designed a menu and then they call their suppliers. They should instead call their farms mm. and say, what's available mm. next week? And then they should design their menus. So in mm. some ways you do have to flip the, the logical sequence of how you think about things, right? And, and and at Patagonia, we don't choose between impact and quality, right? We don't choose mm. between impact and demand. We have to have it all, but we do think about the problems in the world. I mentioned that we the net pen salmon farms are an enemy. We also think about the feedlot beef industry as an enemy. Mm-hmm. We also think mm-hmm. about the chemical farming of the Great Plains as an enemy. So sometimes we actually, you know, think about what products could we be in that have the impact, that have the demand, that have the quality, that take market share away from these enemies because fuck yeah. them and we know that there's opportunities there. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Um you mentioned you did some investing uh while you were kind of in between the the last role and this one. Uh, I know you spent quite a bit of time learning a lot about that space. I think you you almost kind of thought you were going to be a professional investor in some capacity before this role showed up. Um, you know, one thing that I am trying to like ring the alarm on that I don't think it talks gets talked about enough in the space is we have this kind of valley of death for a lot of emerging brands and regenerative that there's not enough well informed and useful funding kind of between pre seed seed and Series A. Right. There's all these brands that are maybe sub five million, sub 10 million that are really getting ready for that first institutional round, but they need some more money that they can't get past just these this great cohort of like region ag angel investors. Um, So it's kind of a bifurcated question. One, your thoughts on trying to solve that. Right. And then two, as you're doing all the supply chain infrastructure and you look at how we're funding regenerative agriculture overall, what opportunities do you see? What hurdles do you see? You know, how, how are you thinking through kind of how the money all works as you do this work? So I don't, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about like ag tech. Yeah, me neither. Anymore, <laughs> I don't, right? Like, so, okay, whatever. I mean, and, and maybe there's a guy that's got some machine that makes cows or bless or whatever, like mm-hmm. that's all fine and interesting. I don't, I don't need that what we're doing right like i'm Mm -hmm. in the business of creating food and by the way i'm not creating alternative foods or foods that that look Mm -hmm. like meat but aren't right like we're creating Mm -hmm. wholesome foods that are just grown using regenerative practices right so in many ways that's not very interesting for venture capitalists and Mm -hmm. i can give a shit like it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter to me i don't care um (laughs) now my job again is to create market opportunities to motivate farmers to convert their farmland there are real problems with that which is that farmers Mm -hmm. think in one year cycles they Mm -hmm. have to be risk averse right because if you screw something up and it costs you a year you're you know you're in a lot of trouble and that's been that's been a a, you know a cultural learning that farmers have learned for generations right because when things go bad it goes bad in a way that can feel existential for them so they do need transitional support and they do need transitional um financing in many cases uh, mm-hmm. But I do think that the the capital markets are rising up to meet that, right? I, I think of a of a, a firm like Iroquois Valley as an example, mm-hmm. whose main job it is is to provide financing for the conversion of farms to regenerative or organic, uh, and they do it in a way that that attempts to preserve the ability for the farmers to to own the equity in the long run. And I think that's important, right? I, I look at many private equity funds that are like we we make money by investing in farmland, and I worry that they're their chasing of carry and of returns is going to mm-hmm. be at the expense of someone, most likely the farmers, right? So I'm not as excited mm-hmm. about that. But I do think that there are um, sources of capital rising up to meet the need for transitions. And, um, you know, yeah, I was going to say, maybe I shouldn't say this loud, but I will say it out loud. Like, if a farmer needs support, you know, we're willing to, to give them an offtake agreement, you know, to give mm-hmm. them that motivation. And offtake agreements, I learned this in my last business where I operated farms, are magical for securing financing. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's 
I think it's quite doable. I don't think this is any amazingly complex problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two two big standouts to me there. One, you know, I get a lot of pitch decks too, and if it's if it involves a su a supply chain disruption that where the business is based on food transactions and they're not starting with the demand side, they're they're doing the business wrong because we can't do anything until we create that market, change the current market, whatever. So like you have to start with demand and, and work backwards, kind of no matter what, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and I think the other big thing that stood out to me there is from my role at RFSI, it's very clear we have this amazing kind of cohort of emerging funders, right? And they're all, we have a great trumpeteer, we have a great saxophone person, we have a great keyboard person, but we haven't harmonized that group yet, right? And we need to continue to try and do that because we have to build yeah. like a real harmonious capital stack for these enterprises because some need debt, some need equity, some need philanthropic yeah. capital, some need all three, yeah. some, you know, some need something else. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is like, you can hope for the rest of your life that there's a, a symphony, but <laughs> that's like, that's the beauty. That's the beauty and the ugliness of capitalism, right? Mm. Is that when there's mm. demand, um, when there's demand, you know, market solutions will arise to it. But of course, the transition periods are messy, right? And there's winners and losers. And there's, you know, this is going to have that as well, right? And, and you know, in, in some cases, the people that don't want to change may mm. find themselves not feeling happy about the way things are changing, which is a bummer. But that's, mm. you know, that's the beauty of it. It's actually one of the reasons why America tends to make transitions in terms of, of, uh, of industries and, and technologies faster than other countries. I'm I'm not confident it will be a smooth, pretty sounding symphony, but I am confident it'll get, <laughs> it'll get done. Yeah, I love that, um, man. Wonderful conversation. Um, I, I just really appreciate you joining us. I, I so appreciate kind of everything that you're bringing to the space. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with our audience today? No, it's just it's good to see. You. It's fun. Awesome, man. I'll well, see you next week, right? Yeah, we will be there in full force. Uh, we're going to be cooking up some cool stuff. So as a little cliffhanger for the audience, be on the lookout for some, some exciting Expo West content and updates. But man, Paul, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. For show notes, episode transcripts, and more information on our guests and what we discuss on the show, check out our website, regen-brands.com. That is regen-brands.com. You can also find our Regen Recaps on the website. Regen Recaps take less than five minutes to read and cover all the key points of the full hour long conversations. You can check out our YouTube channel, Regen Brands Podcast, for all of our episodes with both video and audio. The best way to support our work is to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, subscribe to future episodes, and share the show with your friends. Thanks for tuning in to the Regen Brands Podcast, brought to you by the Regen Coalition and Outlaw Ventures. We hope you learned something new in this episode and it empowers you to use your voice, your time, and your dollars to help us build a better and more regenerative food system. Love you guys.